we started uh, the series on Psalm 24. Just yesterday, you know, we started uh, exploring it. And today we have our beloved sister Lucy Morais that is going to take us on Psalm 24, verse 2 today. Sister Lucy, I hand over to you. God bless you. Um, thank you, Sister Attitude. So welcome, everyone. So today, I get the privilege of teaching Psalm 24, verse 2. So my portion is verse 2. And I titled this presentation, The Greatness of God, because that is what we are going to look at today. Uh, the Amplified Version says, For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the streams and rivers. There it goes. Um, in the New Living Translation, it has it this way. For he laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean's depths. And King James has it as, For he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And NIV has it this way. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So the Lord, okay, the Lord, Yahweh, is the name of God. From verse 1 of Psalm 24, he created the earth. Now, Lord, if, when you look at this psalm, you see Lord all in capitals. And that's important to know because that is the name of God. It's Yahweh. When you see it capitalized, it's referring to the name of God as Yahweh. When you see the Lord in um, non-capital letters, in lowercase, it refers to the name of the Lord as Adonai, meaning my Lord. So in this verse, we're seeing him as Yahweh. Okay, so he created the earth and he created the earth by establishing it upon the seas, as we see here in verse 2. We see God in creation and how he created the earth from the very beginning. So we're going to look at Genesis 1, actually 1 through 3. So Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created by forming from nothing the heavens and the earth. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Verse 2 says, The earth was formless and void, or a waste and emptiness, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the primeval ocean that covered the unformed earth. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And in verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. So God spoke the light into existence. And when God spoke, light came into being. Before that, the earth was formless. It was void, empty. There was nothing there, basically. So in essence, it was just an uncreated mass of dark waters or seas and God's Holy Spirit was moving over the face of the waters. So from verses 1 to 3 in Genesis, we see several distinct aspects of God in creation. So what are those three aspects? Those three aspects of God from creation are energy, or I would call it also movement, vibration, sound, and light. So what do all these three things have in common? The common denominator of energy, sound, and light is frequency. So we're going to look at energy. So first, we see here in verse 2 of Genesis that the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So this movement... I would call energy or vibration, this movement. Uh, Colossians 129, Paul said this. He said, for this I labor, often to the point of exhaustion, striving with his power and energy 
which so greatly works within me. That's Amplified Bible. And you'll see throughout the Bible that the men, the women that God used, when the Holy Spirit will come upon them, all of a sudden they had so much strength, so much energy to go and do exploits. They had the energy to go do what God called them to do. They were empowered for their assignments. And that's, I love this scripture. This is one that Paul describes that power that worked in him, which was the Holy Spirit. He said that power, it works so greatly in me. And it works in all of us, even to this day. So second, we see sound. See, God spoke into that emptiness that void and speaking what is it about speaking involves sound see so sounds came from god the creator first see god spoke four words over the deep or the face of the waters he said let there be light and then light was and so i have a few scriptures to share on this the sound psalm 33 in verse 6 and verse 9 from the amplified version it says by the word of the lord were the heavens made and all their hosts by the breath of his nostrils verse 9 says for he spoke and it was done he commanded and it stood fast And also in Psalm 29, verses 3 to 9, this over here, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Syrian, Mount Hermon, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the doe labor and give birth, and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all are saying glory. And then now we come to light, the third aspect of creation. See, so light then came into being from the spoken word of God. And so we're going to read some scriptures here in the book of John regarding the light. Uh, John 1, 4 says, in him was life and the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it and is unreceptive to it. And John 8, 12, once more, Jesus addressed the and he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And in John 12, 46, he said, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes and trusts in me as savior, all those who anchor their hope in me and rely on the truth of my message, will not continue to live in darkness. So here in John, also regarding the light, we also see that at creation, we, we have God the Father, we have God the Son, and also God the Holy Spirit. We're also there at the beginning of creation. They'll also be there at the end of creation. So these three aspects of energy sound and light are seen here in Genesis 1. So these three things are actually all part of who God is. God is sound, light, and energy. So what do these three things have in common? They all have a frequency by which they can be measured. Although God cannot be measured, 
these these categories that we see her see here on earth the sound the light the energy they all have a frequency sound has a frequency light has a frequency even energy which i would call movement vibration has a frequency i believe that healing can come from the right optimal frequency of sound light and energy together i know that there have been studies done where researchers have looked into healing people through the right sound the right frequency of sound can bring healing i'm no expert i'm not a doctor a mathematician none of that but i believe something can be created that have, incorporates all three aspects of sound light and energy to bring healing to the body and you know god has so much god is so incomprehensible there's so much in god and i know there's so many things that we haven't even yet discovered that can be created to bring healing to the earth to bring healing to his people so all that to say that this is the greatness of our god he is so far beyond our scientists and researchers who try to define earth through their human wisdom and humanism. See, God had a perfect way in his infinite mind on how to create the earth, the stars, the heavens, plant and animal life, and humans. See, out of nothing, God created everything upon the earth. Out of the vast nothingness of the seas, he created life. See, God used the materials on hand, the seas and ocean depths to create the canvas of the earth and everything in it. You see, he spoke the world and the worlds into existence. On the first day of creation, we're going to look at, at all, all six days. On the first day of creation, God created the light by speaking it into existence. And he created categories of light by separating light from darkness. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. You see, on the second day of creation, God created the expanse for the firmament. And he called it heaven. See, this expanse separated the waters under it and the waters above it. And on the third day of creation, Genesis 1-9, God said, again, speaking the word, he said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. He said, or he spoke, let the dry land appear. And God called the dry land earth. The gathering waters he called seas. And then he also said, let the earth sprout. And what did the earth sprout? Vegetation or grass, according to some versions. Plants yielding seeds and fruit trees bearing fruit with seed in them. So the earth sprouted at the spoken word of God. On the fourth day of creation, God created the light bearers. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars in the expanse of heaven to separate day and night as signs to mark seasons, days, and years, and to provide light on the earth. So he made two great lights. The greater light he called the sun, and he created the sun to rule the day. The lesser light he called the moon, and the moon is to rule the night. So now we get to the fifth day of creation. So on the fifth day of creation, God created the living creatures of the sea and the birds to soar above earth in the expanse of heaven. And God told them to be fruitful and to multiply. So now we come to the sixth day. So on the sixth day of creation, God created living creatures on the earth, the livestock, the crawling things, and the wild animals. And then he created man in his own image to have authority on the earth over the fish of the sea the birds of the air, the cattle, and everything that creeps and crawls on the ground. Genesis 127. 
He says, so God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So in six days, all of the creation of the earth and all creatures, all created things were created by God in six days. So we're going to take a look at some scriptures before we go into what I want to talk about. Again, so we're going to look at the greatness of God through some scriptures. I mean, you could, we could be here all day because there's so many scriptures that talk about God and his power, his might, and all that he's done. We're only going to take a look at a few of them. So Romans 4.17 from the Amplified reads this way, as it is written in scripture. I have made you a father of many nations in the sight of him in whom he believed that it's. He's talking about Abraham here. God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Did he not call the earth and all of his creatures into creation with things that didn't exist? Isn't that awesome? Our God is amazing. So Colossians 1 16 to 17 says, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him. That is by his activity and for him. And he himself existed and is before all things and in him, all things hold together. He is a controlling, cohesive force of the universe. And in, especially here in the scripture, if you, when we read John, in John 1, also Colossians 1, and throughout scripture, you'll see, for by him all things are created. God the creator was there, God the son was there, God the Holy Spirit. In this portion, by him all things were created, by Jesus all things were created. He was there at the very beginning with God, and he is God. So we're going to look at Hebrews 11.3 from the Amplified. says, by faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, we understand that the worlds, the universes, the ages were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for the, their intended purpose by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Isaiah, we're going to look at some scriptures from Isaiah. Isaiah 40, 21 and 22 says, Do you who worship idols not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth, the omnipotence of God and the stupidity of bowing to idols? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It is he who stretches out the heavens like a veil and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. What an awesome God. Isaiah 40, 28 reads this way. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord. Here again in all capitals, the Lord, meaning Yahweh. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Does not become tired or grow weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who has no might, he increases power. We know the rest, how that verse ends, but I won't read it. Isaiah 41, verse 4 says, Yes, who has performed and done this, calling forth and guiding the destinies of the generations of nations from the beginning? I, the Lord, all capitals again, I, the Lord, the first and with the last existing before history began the ever present unchanging God. I am he. 
and then we're going to read Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 13. And it reads this way. God says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, only I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. I have declared the future and saved the nation and proclaimed that I am God. And there was no strange alien God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses among the pagans, declares the Lord, that I am God. Even from eternity, I am he. And there is no one who can rescue from my hand. I act and who can revoke or reverse it. Wow, isn't that powerful? Actually, if you go and read the book of Isaiah, you will see God speaking through that entire book. There, there, I don't have, we don't have enough time to put all the scriptures of who he says he is in the book of Isaiah. I just chose a few. Go and read what he, what he says. He's, he continually speaks in Isaiah. I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no God. There is no God besides him. I encourage you to read it. <clears throat> go and read. Go search out who he is in the book of Isaiah. In Job 38, verses 4 through 7. Actually, go read the whole book, the whole chapter, actually, of Job 38 and 39. You'll discover who God is. I don't think we have time. I wanted to read it, but I don't think we have enough time. We'll just read these, these few verses here from four to seven. This is when God comes to Job and he reveals himself to who he is. And he asks Job a couple of questions. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you know and have understanding. Who determined the measurements of the earth, if you know? Or who stretched the measuring line on it? On what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy. So we're just going to read those verses from Job. But I encourage you, go read Job 38 and 39. And God describes all that he did, how he created the stars, the moons, the animals, the vines, and he created man and beasts and everything in that explanation to Job. And then we'll read Psalm 29, verse 10. It says, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. And to that we can say, amen. So we're going to look at some of the attributes of our God. <laughs> three to be exact. See, three attributes of our great God, the creator of the heavens and the earth are implied from verse two of Psalm 24. <clears throat> and we're gonna look at them so that our finite minds can comprehend the infinity, the magnitude and the greatness of our God. I wanna bring us to a place of complete awe complete submission, and complete surrender to this awesome, majestic God who is worthy and deserving of all our praise, all of our life. I want us to come back to that place of reverence and worship and understanding of who our God is. We must at all costs know him. We must spend all of our energy in the pursuit of the knowledge of God. We must know him. We must reverence him and understand why he deserves that reverence. See, when we rightly know who he is, we can worship acceptably and bow in complete surrender to the great majesty in heaven. So 
So we're going to look at the three attributes of God at the establishment of the earth upon the seas. The attributes are just the characteristics of God and who he is. So we're going to look at omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence of God. So the first one that we're looking at is omniscience. So what does that mean? So omniscience means that God is all-knowing. And according to vocabulary.com, omniscience is a state of possessing all the knowledge there is. So omniscience comes from the Latin omni, meaning all, and scientia, meaning knowledge. And so I'm going to use A.W. Tozer to explain omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. And uh, before I share what he wrote, A.W. Tozer, who is he? He is my favorite pastor, teacher, and writer. Okay, he lived, he was born in 1897, and he died in 1963, and he pastored a church in Chicago. He wrote many, many books. And he, I love A.W. Tozer. I encourage you to read his books. You will learn so much knowledge from the writing, from the reading of his books. I think I have in my library now maybe 30 something, 36 of his books that he wrote. They're powerful. If you want to grow in your spiritual life, I encourage you to read the books of A.W. Tozer. This was a man who spent so much time with God. He knew God intimately. And so I'm going to use his explanations of, of omniscience. In his book called The Knowledge of the Holy, he explained omniscience this way. He said, to say that God is omniscient is to say that he possesses perfect knowledge and therefore has no need to learn. He also explained God's omniscience further by stating God perfectly knows himself. And being the source and the author of all things, it follows that he knows all that can be known. And this he knows instantly. And with a fullness of perfections that includes every possible item of knowledge concerning everything that exists or could have existed anywhere in the universe at any time in the past or that may exist in the centuries or ages yet unborn. And brother, this is also A.W. Tozer. God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters, all mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being, all creaturehood and all creatures, every plurality and all pluralities, all law and every law all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feeling, all desires, every unuttered secret, all thrones and dominions, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and in earth, motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven and hell. Wow, what a God. So out of God's infinite knowledge, he spoke the earth into existence and established it upon the material at hand, the seas and the rivers. Who can do that? No one, no one. Only our God, the creator, who is the uncreated one, can do such a spectacular thing. We are all the work of his hands. We are his creation. Whether we be humans, animals, fish, birds, sun, moon, stars, sea, etc. Only one can have that kind of knowledge and perfect power. And power. And it is perfect knowledge. And it is perfect power. So now we're going to look at omnipotence. Omnipotence means that God has all power and is all powerful. See the definition of omnipotence according to vocabulary.com is this, is having unlimited power. Omnipotent comes from the Latin word for total, omni, 
and power. And again, I'm going to use quotes from A.W. Tozer, the knowledge of the holy, to explain it. Uh, to reign, God must have power. And to reign sovereignly, he must have all power. And that is what omnipotent means, having all power. God possesses what no creature can. An incomprehensible plentitude of power, a potency that is absolute. Wow, isn't that amazing? And since he has at his command all of the power in the universe, the Lord, God omnipotent, can do anything as easily as anything else. All his acts are done without effort. He expends no energy that must be replenished. His self-sufficiency makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. All the power <clears throat> required to do all that he wills to do lies in undiminished fullness in his own infinite being. And so now we're going to look at omnipresence. And what does that mean? So omnipresence means that God is everywhere, all at once. So the definition of omnipresence is actually the state of being everywhere, at once, according to vocabulary.com. The Latin word for omnipresence, omnipresence, comes from omni, meaning all or every, and presence, presence. And again, I'm going to use the explanation of A.W. Tozer in the knowledge of the Holy to explain omnipresence. He said it this way. He said, God is everywhere, close to everything, next to everyone. God is over all things, wrote Hildebert of Laverden, under all things, outside all, within, but not enclosed, without but not excluded, above, but not raised up, below, but not depressed, wholly above, residing, wholly beneath, sustaining, wholly within, building. The certainty that God is always near us, present in all parts of the world, closer to us than our thoughts, should maintain us in a state of high moral happiness most of the time. <clears throat> The knowledge that we are never alone calms the troubled seas, the troubled sea of our lives and speaks peace to our souls. All that to say that God is everywhere at the beginning, the middle and the end of all time. He is the one who created time, but he is not bound by time. He exists, he exists out of time. He is at the beginning of creation and he will be at the end of creation. In Revelation, he is described as a God who is, meaning present, the God who was existing in the past and the God who is to come, the future. So God is everywhere. He's in the past, he's in the present and the future and all at the same time. This is the power of who he is. And wow, what a God, what a God he is. So I'm going to read to close. We're going to read Psalm 33, and then we'll pray. Psalm 33 from the Amplified Versions says this. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming an appropriate for those who are upright in heart, those with moral integrity and godly character. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with a loud and joyful sound. For the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, 
and all their host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as in a wineskin. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear and worship the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He makes the thoughts and plans of the people and effective. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The thoughts and plans of his heart in all generations. Blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the sons of man. From his dwelling place, he looks closely upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, who considers and understands all that they do. The king is not saved by the great size of his army. A warrior is not rescued by his great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory. Nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. And finally, behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him and worship him with awe-inspired reverence and obedience. On those who hope confidently in his compassion and loving kindness to rescue their lives from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait expectantly for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for in him our heart rejoices because we trust, lean on, rely on, and are confident in his holy name. Let your steadfast loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us in proportion as we have hoped in you. That is the end of my presentation, but I want to share some prayers. This is who our God is. I hope that we're understanding and coming to the point of realization that our God is awesome. He's amazing. He's holy. He's majestic. In him, all things hold together. And he loves you. He loves me with this perfect love. And there's so many characters, characteristics, so many qualities of our God. He is perfect. He is holy. He's amazing. And he's, um, he is so majestic. Amen. So my prayers, I wrote one out. It's a prayer of repentance, actually, because we take God for granted. We take him too lightly. We become too familiar with him. We begin to treat him just like he's anybody else, like everyone else. So we're going to pray a quick prayer of repentance. So I wrote one out for us. So Lord, forgive us this day for how we have come to treat you and view you. We repent for our small creature thoughts. We have reduced you from the majesty on high and regarded you as a common person. The cares of this world and the busyness of our lives have caused us to walk in spiritual blindness, making us forget who you are and what you are. We didn't create you, but you created us for you alone. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for our blindness, our missteps, and our mistakes. Help us regain our center. That center, the center of our lives, is you. We say that we are sorry, Lord, for dethroning you from our lives and making self the king that sits on the throne. So today we humbly come to you and denounce ourselves that we have sat on your throne as king over our own lives. Today we declare that we are enthroning you as the rightful king who has the only right to sit on the throne of our lives, our hearts, our spirits, and our all. We give you everything and say to you, you can have 
anything you want from us. We are yours after all. For you are awesome and great God, are the one who fashioned and formed us for thine own glory. And we thank thee, our great Jehovah, for your great plan and purpose of creation. We thank thee that you, in your infinite knowledge, power, love, and presence, created us, that we are thy handiwork. We can cry like the psalmist, who is man that you are mindful of him? Who are we that you created us, loved us, planned our lives on this created earth, and put your call and commission upon us? We thank thee, O omnipotent God, that you have given our lives meaning and purpose, joy and hope, strength and encouragement. We love thee. We surrender and we bow down to you. We will worship thee and reverence thee for who you are. And we shall rise from the depths of where we have been. We shall walk onward and upward as good Christian soldiers, obeying, loving, and worshiping thee with all our strength, power, and might. We shall not be moved by anything in the, in the world except by the hope that is held out in the gospel. May that fire that is kindled and rekindled in us never die out. And may that in eternal fire inside us catch many others on fire and until the day we see thee face to face may we never grow tired weary complacent or complain about your great plan purpose call and commission upon our lives may we all continue to pursue you with passion all the rest of our days in jesus name we pray and i want to pray a prayer a short one by A.W. Tozer on the pursuit of God. He says, Oh God, I have tasted thy goodness, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need of further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh God, the triune God, I want to want thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me thy glory, I pray thee, so that, that I may know thee indeed. Begin in mercy a new work of love within me. Say to my soul, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Then give me grace to rise and follow thee up from this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. In Jesus' name, amen. And then just one final prayer for us in GTA. Lord, may all of us in GTA never forget your greatness. May you be the Lord over all of our eight spheres and all of our leaders and team members. May you be the rightful king of every sphere. And through your perfection and all that you are, May we never forget how awesome, amazing, wonderful, majestic, high and holy thou art. Nothing is impossible for you. And everything is yours. You have the master title deed for all things. We bless thee and say that you, that we are yours, your people whom you can use to accomplish great and mighty. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen and amen.